Thank you, Christine. Um, I, I had the unique pleasure, pleasure of actually working for both Jerry Berman and Christine Barney at the same time uh, for several years, and it was a, a, a really an amazing uh, opportunity. So um, I, please have uh, the SOPA panelists uh, take the stage. And um, in, in the interest of time, let me just um, do the introductions and, and, and set the stage for the, this next debate. Um, the, the title of this, this is our, is our main uh, plenary session, and the title that we came up with was Stopping Online Pirates, the Debate. And anyone that knows me knows I really like to have creative uh, you know, t panel titles and a lot, use a lot of alliteration and, and onomatopoeia and things like that, but um, this title pretty much spoke for itself. We were fortunate in the sense that um, I think uh, events have kind of overtaken us uh, in the past several days, even though we planned this thing like three or four months ago. Uh, we decided to have a, a, this be the, the main session because everybody seems to be talking about it this time. Um, we have two engineers uh, on the panel to talk about some of the engineering aspects, which seem to be on the top of my, Congress's mind. And we also have two people to speak from a variety of different perspectives. So let me just really quickly introduce um, our panelists. We have Paul Brigner to my left, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for the Motion Picture Association of America. Um, Paul was also, I met Paul when he was um, working for Verizon Communications, so he has a, um, he has a very varied background. Um, next to him is Dr. Stephen Crocker, who is the CEO of Shinkura Inc., um, and he also happens to be the chair of um, the board of ICANN. Um, next to him we have, uh, well we should have, at the very end, we have Steve well, Tepp, okay. uh, who is the chief IP uh, <laughs> counsel uh, at the Global Intellectual Property Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And, and at the very end, uh, at clean, cleanup, so to speak, is um, Mike Masnick, who's the editor of, of TechDirt, which is a very widely uh, followed blog. I think even our video crew actually follows Tech, TechDirt. Um, and uh, he is also the founder of Floor 64, which is a consulting firm. So in, in the past several days, um, uh, you know, on Friday and Thursday and Friday, uh, uh, Ch Chairman Leahy um, and, and Chairman Smith on the House side um, both indicated in, in various language that they were going to remove the DNS um, resolution filtering uh, provisions from uh, their respective bills in the House and Senate. Uh, Protect IP in the Senate, uh, SOPA uh, in the House. Um, and then over the weekend, I guess um, the White House was working, uh, decided to work, work late into the hours on Friday and on Saturday they released a, uh, they responded to um, an online petition, which I don't know if you know, they have these petitions that people uh, ask the White House about and they re sometimes respond to them and they felt compelled on Saturday um, to have uh, Howard Schmidt, who's the cybersecurity czar, uh, Victoria Espinel, who is the intellectual property czar, so to speak, um, as, and also the chief technology officer, Anish Chopra, um, to to issue a statement saying that it was, it was a long statement, I don't really care to paraphrase it. Um, it, it emphasized cybersecurity, but also I would say um, indicated that something should be done. Um, so uh, that's where we stand. We, we start the session off, I think, today. I think the, the members of Congress come back today at 6 o'clock, um, and we, we have this debate teed up. So what I asked everybody to do is have like three minutes or, uh, of of opening remarks, and then we'll get to some moderated questions, and then we'll go to your questions, if that's okay. So let me go to um, uh, Paul Brigner first. Paul. Great. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you uh, to the Internet Caucus Advisory Council for giving me this opportunity to speak on this distinguished panel. And it really is an honor to be on this panel, um, because uh, some of the credentials here are, are truly amazing, uh, but also because I'm relatively new to the copyright debates. I'm relatively new to the motion picture industry. I joined the MPAA about a year ago as the Chief Technology Policy Officer. Prior to that, I had spent about a decade at Verizon. And at Verizon, I spent about half of my career there doing software and network architecture. And then prior to Verizon, I had a number of years doing software. So while I was at Verizon, I uh, caught the um, Washington uh, fever, I suppose, and went to law school then moved into technology policy. So that kind of explains how I went from uh, geek to policy wonk. And uh, the policy wonk has kind of taken over more recently, but uh, have a, a good foundation in internet technology that I leverage as I do my work. So when I joined the MPAA, I was uh, really full of hope. And uh, all I could see in, in taking that, that job was just opportunity because there was this piece of legislation that was floating around called COICA, uh, the Combating Online Infringements and Counterfeits Act. Knew it was very controversial for its potential effects on the internet, but honestly, you know, when I joined, I didn't know a great deal about it or uh, to what degree that, uh, that debate uh, would, would rise. And I knew that whether it was deserved or not, the MPAA had a very bad reputation for dealing with technological advances, 
uh, adapting business models. And moreover, in just dealing with stakeholders in the, um, in the ecosystem of uh, the internet as well as uh, in policy circles. So it looked like a great opportunity, you know, pure disruption. And for a technologist, uh, you can't beat that. And on top of that, the association was going through a major change and getting a new CEO, um, major reorganization internally. So this just looked great. I thought, hey, all that's needed here is uh, a technologist with the right background and uh, the willingness to open a dialogue with different stakeholders, work with this new um, administration at MPAA, and we'll solve these problems right away. And boy, was I naive. <laughs> I had no idea what I was, uh, what I was getting into. Um, so, you know, hey, my heart was in the right place, and, uh, and I've tried very hard to, to move forward with this debate. So we fast forward to today, and despite all of my best efforts, uh, the past year has been dominated by really a bitter war between Silicon Valley and the content industry. And it's, it's a shame, because a lot of it has been fueled by, I think, misinformation and exaggeration about some of the things that the MPAA and, and others uh, were trying to accomplish in this legislation. But there were also good faith concerns raised by technologists, by Dr. Crocker and, and uh, Mr. Masnick and others that needed to be addressed. But the, the reality is today is that DNS filtering is, is really off the table for this legislation, and the MPAA is now supportive of the sponsors in moving forward, and uh, DNS filtering is not part of that moving forward position. So I don't think it's productive for us to debate either the technical merits or the shortcomings of DNS filtering here, and DNSSEC and, and how it might uh, impact the internet. That's probably not the right kind of discussion that would be helpful for any of us. Rather, I think we have an opportunity to accomplish what I hoped for when I first joined the MPAA, and that was to open a dialogue about moving forward. Um, we need, we desperately need to not only for the benefit of our economy and for the future of the internet to stop online theft, online counterfeits. We need to address many other technology policy issues. We need to address privacy. Um, and all of these issues are going to require a, an open dialogue between businesses and internet technologists so that we can move forward in a very productive way. So, you know, I, I look back and uh, I look for some precedent to see how we might do this. And I think we do have some good precedent that just happened over the last year that we can look to as a model. Um, the content industries and internet service providers came together over the past year to develop, uh, to develop a more uniform notice and pass-through system that uh, relies heavily on educating consumers about copyright infringement and nudging them to curb online their illegal online behavior. So this was in a voluntary, uh, this is a voluntary uh, uh, initiative by these parties that came together and they worked together for a very long time to create something that both could be happy with but also would actually help solve the problem. So with that in mind, I kind of have that in the back of my mind thinking that maybe now is the time to take a look at either DNS filtering or other mechanisms that can be a technological impediment to accessing these rogue sites on the internet. Because we need more than just stopping, uh, than just following the money and addressing the search results. There needs to be some indication that when you try to go to these rogue sites, you shouldn't be there. And uh, hopefully we can uh, accomplish that. So for our part, uh, I think, you know, and I'm speaking for MPAA, um, in opening the, this dialogue and, and showing our sincerity, I think we need to, to demonstrate our commitment to technologies like DNSSEC. Uh, if there was ever any thought that the MPAA did not fully support DNSSEC, it was just flat out wrong. I mean, 
our industry relies, our, the future of our industry relies on the internet and, and that architecture needs to be as secure and as robust as possible. So we are all in favor of that. So as the chief technologist, I, I can uh, get our technologists together from the studios and I can encourage that adoption and that is what I intend to do. I, uh, if there's any groups that we can join or any activities that we can take on to move forward with the adoption of DNSSEC, um, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to push very hard for that. So with the final thought, I just wanted to emphasize one thing that uh, another lesson that I've learned over the past year is that technology, the technology community and the technology uh, subject in general and the content industries, they really, really are one and the same. And now that I've kind of been in, the, uh, in both camps, you could say, I, I probably see that more clear than most, but any movie that you see these days is just dominated by technology and its production and its creation and its distribution. Technology is just pervasive. It couldn't happen. The, the, the movies could not be created today the way they are and, and with the special effects and all the other um, traits that they have without great technology and without great technologists behind the scenes. And vice versa, technology probably wouldn't, young kids who are interested in technology probably wouldn't go there. They wouldn't go into that field if it weren't for some of the movies they saw when they were young and kind of triggered them into thinking, wow, this technology stuff is great. This sci-fi movie just showed me what, what else possible and what I might be able to do in the future. And they go down that technology path. I just took my son yesterday, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be uh, working for MPA if I didn't kind of uh, push a movie while I'm here. I took my son yesterday to see Hugo. It's a Paramount film. And any technologist who hasn't seen that should go right away while it's still in theaters. It is an awesome movie. I know I'm about to get pulled here, but it's an, it's an awesome movie about a little boy trying to find his purpose in life. And the, there's an underlying theme of the technology playing a role. And there's also a theme of how Hollywood and how the movie industry played a role. It's a great, great movie. Go see it. I'm here to move forward. And I, I hope that our, my counterparts would go along with me. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Doctor? Thank you. Um, so I want to make a couple of light remarks and then uh, try to be a, a bit more serious. Um, uh, Tim mentioned that I'm uh, uh, chairman of the board of I ICANN and also CEO of Shinkura. I'm, I'm here mostly in the, in the latter capacity um, and, and speaking on my own uh, behalf as opposed to uh, on behalf of ICANN. However, I, I, I just had this realization uh, I can't oversees the domain name system, the addressing, and the other uh, unique uh, uh, parameters that are part of the infrastructure of the internet. And uh, we've never viewed ourselves as being part of the content um, uh, side of things. But, uh, but I do realize now from your remarks, Paul, that we are part of the entertainment industry because we get uh, an enormous amount of attention. And I've, I've never quite uh, seen us as being uh, in the entertainment business before. Um, the other, uh, the other thought uh, that I want to share is that uh, I've spent the last uh, um, seven, eight years actively uh, pushing forward on DNSSEC. And uh, your, uh, your remarks about uh, having MPAA uh, be actively supportive is extremely heartwarming. So as far as I'm concerned, you're my new best friend. Here we go. <laughs> Mission accomplished, almost. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, and for my part, and many of my colleagues, I think would be absolutely delighted uh, to work closely with you. And I think that there's uh, a lot of constructive uh, things that will come out of that. Um, and, and so let me, let me push on that theme for just a minute. Um, uh, the end of the last session closed with the thought that the solutions are going to come from a multi-stakeholder approach, from uh, meetings and collections of people like this, as opposed to, uh, so, sort of implied but not directly stated, having all out drag out, drag down fights in Congress and uh, you know, uh, uh, vicious political warfare. Um, the, the subject matter involved is, it, it, it's not so arcane that there's only five people in the world who can understand it. We're not talking about relativity theory or rocket science, but it is 
uh, nuanced and, and has subtleties and requires actually getting into the, into the issues. Um, when uh, the uh, COICA um, legislation was first on the table, which then evolved into PIPA and SOPA and so forth, um, and the focus was, there, there, and there was a, a very specific element in there about DNS filtering, uh, several of us uh, responded uh, in the following way, which I want to suggest is balanced, but what came out, of course, was, was, was uh, would, would appear to be one-sided. We completely understood that uh, there's a lot of piracy, that it's bad, and that in our case, uh, it's even bad in personal ways, and that some of us had uh, content that was being pirated. Uh, we also understood, of course, that uh, grabbing hold of the mechanism of filtering at the DNS level was attractive if you are standing far away from things, but when you understand where that fits into the architecture, what the consequences are, and all of this has been laid out, I'm not going to go uh, into it at great depth, uh, we could see that the unintended consequences were going to be quite negative, and so we organized and uh, uh, started to raise our voices in that direction. Um, what is, is where we are at the moment, the fact that it's been taken out of legislation at, at, the, at the moment is, makes us feel good for about five microseconds and then we are sober enough to understand that this is just a moment in time that, that there will be uh, follow-ons and uh, frankly that's the state of affairs in the U.S. and uh, there are uh, similar activities uh, in different states of play around the world. Um, the most positive thing that can come out of all of this is exactly as you said, the realization that um, there are some shared values, there are some common cause, and that what we need to do is to find a way to work together to sort out the distinction between what those goals are and what are appropriate mechanisms to pursue those. Um, and, uh, and the solutions might not be easy and they might not, uh, and there might not, there's no guarantee that there is a solution for, for every sort of problem. Um, surely one element in this whole puzzle is that the internet is a global resource and challenges all of the institutional and legal and political boundaries that, had, that have emerged over the thousands of years of civilization and, and geography and now we're, we're in a, a qualitative change. So international cooperation and struggling through the differences in, in uh, legal systems and in value systems and in cultures around the world is going to take quite a while to sort out, but it surely has to be one of the major dimensions of this. And the technology will be uh, uh, something that will be helpful in some cases, it will be challenging in other cases, um, and in all cases I think we want to be uh, relatively delicate and careful and thoughtful about it. Um, one of the things that I think will be helpful is getting uh, useful, uh, real data on how big the problems are, what the effectiveness of different solutions might be, and uh, bringing that out in a, um, an objective and uh, uh, sort of unforced way so that uh, people can understand what those issues are. Uh, you mentioned uh, following the money is uh, not sufficient uh, and, the, and the search engines and so forth. Uh, there's mixed data on, on this, frankly, and I'm not uh, authoritative enough to, to say I know exactly what the answers are, uh, but I think it would be helpful to lay all of the possible solutions on the table, to lay the various mechanisms on the table, and to uh, very uh, carefully and in, in, a, in, in the finest tradition of uh, the openness of American society, uh, look at that data, get more data where we can, and, uh, and, and be kind of objective about that. And I think that will be a positive sum game for everybody. I don't think we're stuck in a zero sum game of uh, it's important for us to win in order for you to lose, or, or, or it's important for you to lose and for us to win, actually. Um, I, I, I think there's a way in which we can get a, a positive uh, result for everybody. Well, um, normally I'm a tyrant when it comes to uh, the, the minutes I allot for the opening statement, but it seemed like you guys had something to get off your chest, and I, I, there was an interesting back and forth, so I'm, I'm happy to, I think that was really an interesting exchange. I want to get back to some of those themes and also maybe your question about um, quantifying piracy and what that yeah. means. Um, 
but we still have a bill in play <clears throat> in, in Congress, in both houses, in both chambers. Um, and so if I could just continue on with, with Steve uh, and then with Mike about you know, other aspects of, of the legislation, and then we can get back to perhaps the kind of multi-stakeholder approach or working on DNSSEC, and, um, but there's other elements, so if we could cover some of those. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Tim. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm honored to have this opportunity to speak to you today, both here in person and beyond. The thing I'd like everyone to keep in mind, and we kind of jumped right into the weeds, deep into the weeds, uh, naturally given the expertise of the first two panelists. What I would like everyone to keep in mind, of course, is what we're talking about here are American jobs, protecting consumers, and foreign criminals that are engaged in theft online, theft of America's most creative and innovative products, the type of theft, the type of rogue sites that cannot be defended, that should not be defended. And I take as very good news that there is universal agreement among policymakers in Washington that rogue sites present a clear and present danger to the American economy, to American consumers, and that Congress does need to act because while this activity is entirely illegal already, and inconsistent with international standards of protection from the World Trade Organization, that the reality is these sites, when they are operated entirely outside the United States, and particularly in countries that do not have adequate or effective protection for intellectual property, they can operate with impunity, and they are doing so, and they're making boatloads of money at our expense. We deserve better. Now, as we've already heard, the most controversial part of the bill, the part that has generated the most uproar about blocking access to these sites, has essentially been uh, taken off the table because both the sponsors of the Protect IP Act in the Senate and the Stop Online Piracy Act in the House Chairman Leahy and Chairman Smith, respectively, have indicated we've heard the concerns. On top of all the other changes we've already made, particularly to the House bill, we're going to roll back that provision of the bill. So we now stand at a place where the provision that has generated the most controversy, the most uproar, is being addressed. And what we're left with is a very narrow, carefully tailored, narrowly targeted bill that addresses the worst of the worst online thieves, whether it's the Senate bill or the House bill. And we know they'll still go through the legislative process and there'll still be more tweaks here and there, and that's fine. That's the way it's supposed to happen. That's why there have been five congressional hearings on this topic already and two and a half markups. The House one, of course, is still in progress after a day and a half. That's the way the legislative process is supposed to work, and that's great. But what is encouraging to me is that we're in a place now where there's recognition that we have a problem, that it needs to be addressed, and we have sponsors of the legislation who are willing, able, and have addressed the major concerns out there. So we need to move forward with this legislation. This is crime that is happening as we speak, every day, and as we move forward, we need to keep in mind that in order to slay this dragon, we need more than a fly swatter, okay? This legislation has to have some ability to disrupt the business model of counterfeiters and pirates who are selling dangerously defective products who are distributing malware, who are facilitating identity theft. There's a coalition of over 400 businesses and associations that supports action against rogue sites. There's support from across the political spectrum, from the National Conference of State Legislatures, from the US Conference of Mayors, from 43 of the state attorneys general we can work out the details, we should work out the details, we will work out the details, but we need to move forward and we need to move forward as soon as possible. Thanks.
All right. Um, so uh, first, I, I'm going to say I probably disagree with almost everything that Steve just said. But um, in the interest of uh, putting that off for a second um, and uh, just giving very, very brief uh, opening points, um, I, I, um, not being from DC and not spending much time in DC um, and being told that we weren't having opening remarks, um, I didn't prepare sort of detailed opening remarks. I didn't realize that that meant we were also going to have um, detailed opening remarks. So I just want to make three quick points and then um, we can jump into the debate on, on everything that everybody's been talking about because I think there's a lot of interesting things to talk about. Um, the first is I think that um, I think everyone admits that piracy is a problem, but I think that um, most of the debate, uh, the problem is that we have misdiagnosed what the nature of that problem is. Um, there is a feeling that it is a legal problem or it is an enforcement problem. And I think there's very little uh, to perhaps no evidence that that is the case. I think, in fact, it is very much a business problem and it's a business model problem. And we've seen over time um, two things. One is that greater enforcement does not make a difference, does not help, in fact, often makes it worse. Um, but what does work and what does fix things is greater innovation and greater innovation within business models. Um, those who embrace what the internet allows and what it enables have shown that they can uh, very successfully compete with uh, any sort of setup that involves piracy. In fact, they can embrace it and be better off for it. Um, the second point is that I think it, one of the, another problem with this debate is that there's been a very dangerous uh, um, readiness to conflate uh, trademark infringement and copyright infringement, which are two very, very different issues. Um, and I think there are reasons why those two issues are lumped together. Um, and I think it is unfortunate, and I think it has distorted the debate in a lot of different ways. Um, there are very real pr problems or issues with both of them, but they're very different issues. Putting them together in a single bill is dangerous and allows for <laughs> exaggerations uh, in terms of how the bill is presented and what the bill does. And then the third one is that, reflecting those first two points, um, I think it is exceptionally dangerous to uh, muck around with the internet, um, especially when uh, the design of uh, the designers involved in mucking around with the internet often don't seem to quite understand how the internet works um, or what it does. Uh, and one of the issues that I know uh, has already been brought up a little bit is this idea of um, technology and uh, content industries and sort of the back and forth between them. I think what is being left out of this um, and there's also a big problem is the fact that consumers and actual internet users are often left out and not considered an important stakeholder here. And yet I think what uh, and what hasn't been mentioned yet and what we've been seeing online um, over the last few months and, and weeks and days um, is that internet users take this issue very, very seriously as well um, and feel very much like they've been marginalized and left out of the debate. And that has led to the actions that are um, going on uh, today and leading into tomorrow where sites like Reddit and Wikipedia are planning to black out in protest of what's happened with this bill. I think it's very dangerous to think that this is an issue that can just be solved by um, a couple of companies perhaps sitting down together and working out issues without recognizing what uh, the consumers and internet users are saying as well. Well, let's let's follow on with that last point about <clears throat> Paul. You talked about uh, working in a multi-stakeholder process with on, on DNSSEC and, and and some meeting of the minds there. Um, but as we move forward, you know, people are going to sit down. You know, the, who sits down and actually hammers this stuff out? Um, honestly, the, the the camera crew that's covering this today, um, they don't they usually don't care about anything we're talking about. But today, they were interested to come and listen to the SOPA debate. On the playground, I'm getting questions about SOPA uh, with my my kids. It's pretty it's pretty widespread um, over the so. I guess who is it that sits down um, and and kind of carves this thing up, or are we, are we past that? DNSSEC seems to be off the table in these bills. Does that mean they're just going to move it more expeditiously, or is there going to be more of a stakeholder process of bringing people in? Uh, before this legislation is passed. Uh, can the White House broker some type of multi-stakeholder process? Because as far as I can tell, within the Department of Commerce and elsewhere, um, this administration has not seen a multi-stakeholder process that it didn't like. Um, there's multi-stakeholder processes <laughs> everywhere. Um, why doesn't this one deserve one? And so if I could ask you guys to, wh who actually sits down and, and how do we have a, 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 a kind of a larger you know, input process into this? Well, I think Congress has done that. I mean, you've got 
It's, it's the job of Congress to make the laws, right? We, that's what they're elected to do. That's a representative democracy. And they have been open door the whole time for anyone to come in who's got a concern. Uh, the, uh, the National Consumers League, for example, has uh, indicated that the harm from dangerously defective products on rogue sites is a major consumer issue, and they want to see rogue sites addressed to help protect consumers. Uh, 60 plus, uh, a group representing uh, retired Americans, has made it very clear they want to see uh, rogue sites that are selling counterfeit medica medications that can literally and have literally killed people uh, and certainly make them sick, at the very least not treat what they think they're being treated for, uh, they want to see that addressed. Those groups have come into Congress. There's been several hearings representing, I think it's five different hearings representing uh, experts and perspectives from every angle. Uh, people have made their feelings known on the internet as well, and that's part of the way we express ourselves in democracy. Well, the one hearing I saw in the House, um, uh, the one, there was one representative um, you know, kind of opposed to legislation, that was Google, uh, a yeah, fine company, by the way, they're actually a sponsor, um, mm -hmm. so I don't want to say anything bad. But there's more than, more than just Google out there. Now, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Crocker, I know you're here in the context of Shinkura and as an engineer. Um, that said, you know, ICANN has, I mean, talk about multi-stakeholder processes. Um, again, how do, you, how do you get smaller sites that, you know, perhaps could be operating overseas and, and, and involved in this process? Um, in a, in a better way. Is, would the White House help out with that? So, um, the, um, there, there are multiple multi-stakeholder venues. Um, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, is one of the older ones for bringing technical people together across a wide range of uh, organizations and interests to build technical protocols. Their scope is, does not cover the set of issues that we're talking about. ICANN is another multi-stakeholder operation uh, organization that brings people together uh, for its purpose. I think what emerges out of the discussions that we're having here and, and the debates and, and all of this is the beginnings of what I anticipate will be a, a new uh, multi-stakeholder um, dialogue, um, not so much in the form of advocacy groups that are coming before Congress and saying we're right, they're wrong, you know, have to choose our side, but uh, more lower key and, and more thoughtful and off stage, if you will, um, kinds of discussions. I don't think that there is a formal organization associated that is the exact right thing, so it will be a kind of information, uh, 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 kind of formative activity. The White House is actually um, uh, you know, they the, the, the can't go on the record, but I, I know that they have fostered some of that kind of discussion already, uh, and I think that there will be more. Exactly how it will come out, exactly who will be in the room, I, I don't know precisely, but I think it's less important to try to specify that in advance and more important to just try to do it. And as uh, any of those conversations become constructive, and insightful and sort out the issues at the level of detail that they need to be sorted out, it will bring more people to the, to the table. So, so Mike, you have, you, you know, <coughs> you have a diverse uh, followership. followership. Um, you have a lot of people following you. You represent a lot of different folks. Um, it's kind of more organic. How do you, how do you get involved? How does, how does your membership get involved in this process? Well, I think, I, I mean, I think that certainly part of the problem is that they, they certainly don't feel that they're involved in this process at all. For all the hearings um, that may have been held, and, and I, I question how much of that was just kind of show trial versus actual hearings, um, you know, we have these two bills, both of which we're expecting new manager's amendments on, um, neither of which we've seen uh, in any detail yet. We have no idea what's actually going to be in the manager's amendment. We've been told, we've been hinted at. Um, DNS probably removed, but possibly just delayed. Um, there was some indications, at least from Senator Leahy, that he was only merely delaying the implementation of the DNS, not necessarily removing it from the bill. Um, the fact that the Senate then is planning to move forward with the bill um, without the fact that any of us has seen it, I don't know if you've seen uh, the manager's amendment, but certainly nobody else has, um, 
that's a big concern. That is not public involvement. That is not involvement in any way, shape, or form. That's the kind of thing where there should be time for people to review it. There should be time for people to discuss it. Um, you know, whether or not anyone agrees that you know, one of the alternative bills that has been proposed, the open bill um, from Representative Issa in the House and Senator Wyden in the Senate, um, whether or not you agree with that, what they did was, was actually very interesting in that they put up that bill online um, in a system that anyone can, can comment on, um, can uh, discuss before they actually you know, did the, the actual in introduction of the bill, which I think was supposed to happen today, um, mm -hmm. after there was widespread discussion that anyone could be involved in. That is a much more open process. That actually involves the public. That involves you know, all real stakeholders in the fact that they can actually take part in it. The idea that you know, we're going to get a PDF drop, and then two days later, there's going to be a major vote on a bill is not a process that really involves the public in any way. And that's part of the reason why people are upset and feel that they're excluded from this entire process. Can, can we just clarify for folks who may not be familiar with the Senate procedure and all that, what a manager's amendment is, just to, so everyone's clear in terms of the process, if Senator Leahy does as he said he will, so we all expect, have a set of amendments to the Protect IP Act, when the Senate begins to consider that bill, that's just the very start of the open debate that'll be posted online, people will be able to read it, there'll be probably days of debate on the Senate floor, there'll be opportunities to offer amendments, including complete substitute amendments, like uh, other legislation. So that's an open process. That's the way our Congress works. If we can step back from the specific legislation and say, I think the question was more about what bodies are appropriate, what, what are, uh, examples are there to follow for moving forward with technological approaches, not so much looking at w what is in these bills right now. And I, for, with that, I would agree uh, with the examples that Dr. Crocker raised. Uh, I think those are some great ones. There's organizations, uh, multi-stakeholder organizations like the Internet Society that uh, could be a very good place to bring these questions and work them out. There's um, uh, the Internet Governance Forum. There's just a number of them. The Internet is kind of built on those organizations, which we can leverage. So let me just add, uh, follow up one more thing on process. Um, and and you, you, you both uh, started off by saying, you know, we, maybe we can get together and work some of these things out on the DNS SEC and DNS side. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, we had a debate. We called it Copyright Strikes. Um, it was a debate here. We had the, the chairman of the Internet Caucus in the UK talking about their legislation to to you know, terminate access for repeat infringers of our ISPs. There was legislation in France, of course, Hong Kong, other areas around the world. Uh, we didn't have one in the US, but people were expecting it imminently. Well, a year and a half later in July this year of 2011, um, all the major ISPs got together and, and had a memorandum of understanding and seemed to kind of say, we can address this issue with some education, with some kind of prompting of users to, to stop repeat infringers. No legislation was necessary. You know, let's say the, this bill does not pass or the, 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 it's, it's slowed down. Do you think that that's more appropriate forum uh, to maybe just get, have people to get together, whether it be payment processors, uh, search engines, ISPs, and maybe kind of do some of these things um, with, with um, a tailored response, as Dr. Crocker was saying, like measurable statistics, and, and figure out how we can we address this. Is that, is that possible, or this, bill, this legislation is going through? What do we, what do we think? This legislation is going through. <laughs> so I, th I think we should look towards the technical measures that are not included, like DNS filtering, let's take those to another forum. But, but I, I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't that be a concern? The fact that, you know, I mean, the MPAA and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce have been saying this bill's going through for, you know, the last nine months, and yet many people have been raising these issues um, that much, much later, after we're being told that those are no concern at all, um, suddenly in the last week we're being told that that's a concern and then we're going to you know, we're going to see a, a different version of the bill, and then, you know, before it actually gets significant chance for people to look at it, discuss it, debate it, um, you know, the legislation is going to be pushed. Well, as Steve to pointed out, I mean, the, the, really, the debate is just beginning. So I say that kind of in jest, but uh, I, all I was <laughs> suggesting is that I can't go down the scenario of, of uh, this bill not making it because you know that's definitely where we we want this to head. But the, the debate is beginning. The answer to your question, Tim, is that all of these different processes have a role in fighting a huge problem of online counterfeiting and piracy. So voluntary agreements, like the copyright alert system that you described, is a great way to help educate ordinary, everyday users of the internet 
who may not realize that some of the things that they've done aren't actually uh, kosher. And, and that's a very useful tool. When you're talking about foreign criminal enterprises that exist to profit off others' creativity and innovation, that design websites specifically to make it look like they're legitimate, when in fact, of course, everything on there or nearly everything on there is fake, those folks aren't interested in responding to a notice. Those folks need stronger medicine. F fair point. Um, I, I think I'm on the hook to, to field some questions, and if I, can, if I can ask that the questions be very, very laconic, uh, please don't issue a statement in lieu of a question. But I have one question I want to get to in between those questions is on substance. There was a debate over the weekend on MSNBC on a TV show that I've never, ever watched in my entire life before um, with, with General Counsel Cotton and uh, the fellow from Reddit about, and there was a debate, it really wasn't much of a debate, but it's this difference of opinion about whether it affected U.S. sites. And I wanna, that seems to be a question I get a lot, and I'd like to see if we can parse that a little bit um, in between some questions. And I think I have a gentleman in the front row, and my colleague, um, Eric, has the microphone right here. So we have a question here and a question from that gentleman. Hi, I'm Isaac Meister from Stop Badware. Um, Notwithstanding the conflation of pills for the phallically challenged and um, TV show websites and the like that SOPA is supposedly to address, um, uh, I, this is actually a question mostly for um, Mr. Chairman over there. Um, uh, what, it seems like what everybody is, what SOPA appears to be designed to do is to stop abuse of domain names in a variety of different ways, they, uh, which implicates intellectual property concerns, um, public health concerns, et cetera. Um, if ICANN were doing its job keeping who is uh, and other accountability for, dom for the use of domain names where it should be, would this legislation even be necessary? <laughs> and you can answer that briefly, because I think we want to move beyond ICANN, but. Yeah. The, uh, there, there is a lot of very legitimate debate about the quality of the information and who is and about what the enforcement mechanisms are, are and so forth. But even if you had 100 percent absolute purity and accuracy about who is information, the focus of this legislation is for sites that are operating outside of U.S. control. So the hypothesis there is that we already know what we need to know about them. We just can't get at them from a U.S. enforcement point of view. So I think that's quite separate from the who is debate. The, the who is debate is a legitimate question, but I don't think it actually is the, uh, the point of leverage for the kind of things that we're talking about here. Um, a question right here. David Green, NBC Universal. A question for Dr. Crocker. Uh, McAfee has written reports about the uh, cybersecurity implications of the rogue sites and how they're linked to spam and malware and other kinds of viruses. Um, is that in accord with your research and do you think that uh, a bill that will uh, impact the ability of these rogue sites to continue will help on cybersecurity? Uh, well, the short answer is yes. Um, but, but you've put two things in there that, I, that again, I would counsel need to be looked at uh, separately. One is, what is the actual impact of these sites with respect to cybersecurity? And, and uh, I think that there is quite a bit of evidence that there are some uh, negative effects there that have to be looked at. Uh, the, the other question, which I think is very, very important, is let's assume this bill goes through in, in, with the modifications that uh, are being anticipated. Uh, is that going to solve the problem? Who knows? Um, I don't think, frankly, that uh, on the day that that bill passes, that all of us can, can rest easy and say, ah, pro case, case solved, case closed, you know, it's, it's all taken care of. I think it's important to measure. I think it's important to, uh, to understand what the actual dynamics are. There's an underground economy. There's a lot of players and actors involved in all this. There's a lot of very good research. This isn't the time or place to go into, into great depth, but it's pretty fascinating. And um, uh, delving into that, understanding all of that, and bringing that up to the place where the policy people and the law enforcement people and the technical people all have comparable data is, I think, absolutely vital. I think, just to, to add to that, I think it's, it's really important that we actually are looking at the facts and the actual data on these issues, and I think that that is something that's, that's definitely been lacking in a lot of this debate. Um, you know, if we look over the past 35 years, copyright law has been changed 16 times. 
Um, and basically every two to potentially three years, um, the folks in the MPA, the RIA, and whoever else goes back to Congress and says, what we did last time didn't work, we gotta do this again. And every time they change something without knowing whether or not it's gonna work, without doing any research beforehand as to whether or not it's gonna work, some of the bills have things that say, okay, we'll study it afterwards and see whether or not it worked. We, I, I think at some point we have to step back and say, is this the right approach to you know, every few years muck with this particular law, duct tape on something different, and change it when we have no idea if it works. And historically, what's been shown is every time we change enforcement, every time we ratchet up enforcement in some way or another, it doesn't work. It just makes the infringement actually, in, in many cases, become greater, and in some cases become harder to deal with and harder to track down. Whereas if we focus on actual systems to innovate, allow more business models to flourish, to allow new companies to, to thrive, those things seem to have real impact on, on piracy. If you look at Sweden as a perfect example of this. You know, the Pirate Bay is based in Sweden, and there was a tremendous amount of piracy in Sweden. The thing that stopped, there, you know, there was an attempt at different laws and, and greater and greater enforcement, and it had very, very brief impact where it shut things down, everyone moved somewhere else, and the piracy rate actually went up. What actually impacted and kept piracy, had piracy start to go down in Sweden was the introduction of Spotify, and the fact that you had a real business, a legitimate business that could offer something that was better than what the pirate sites offered. So when you have those real businesses out there, then you deal with this problem. But that's not an enforcement issue, and it's not a legal issue, it's a business model issue. Uh, Eric, I have a question from the woman in the fourth row. We have a, a question in the front row. Um, and while we, while we do that, let me just ask, ask a question in the form of a statement you can disagree or agree with me. Um, the question on NBC, um, MB, that MSNBC show was whether this affected US sites. Now, my understanding was, in the House SOPA bill, um, there were the chairman's amendment from several about a month, a month uh, several weeks ago, um, was in the in the private right of action, so to speak, in, in code word, was that it, the private right of action was for foreign sites and uh, domestic sites, and then the chairman's amendment removed the domestic site provision. So when it comes to you know observing uh, one of the you know one of the processes on a, a U.S. site, that was taken off the table in that chairman's amendment. That said. Um, there is, a, uh, like, sites like Google and Reddit and others could have foreign domain names, like, you know, google.ru or google.de. And under this legislation, um, those, um, those uh, foreign sites, um, as defined, whether it be de or ru, <coughs> would be affected by this legislation. So just, <coughs> that's not true? And no. the definition of a foreign site? No, because it's, it's not just the foreign domain name. Uh, it's got to be limited to, <coughs> excuse me, where the owner or operator of the site cannot be, is not and cannot be located in the United States, and the site has to be U.S. directed. So uh, a site like you've described obviously would be directed toward the Russian market, not to the American market. So I think that Chairman Smith did a pretty good job in his manager's amendment of sealing off, you know, we have tools under existing law to deal with sites where either the domain is issued by registry or registrar in the U.S., or the operator of the site can be found here, and that's fine. Okay. But it's where we have these sites entirely outside the U.S. that we do need some additional measure. And, and the second part is perhaps um, to say, to clarify things, while well, the, the actions wouldn't be take against, taken against U.S. sites, um, U.S. sites like PayPal, uh, search engines, um, uh, ad networks, essentially, that are based in the U.S., would be impacted by the legislation because they'd have to comply with process and things like that. Is that, that that's fair? Well, all they'd have to do is, after a court order, then they'd stop offering their services exactly. to the site dedicated to this type of criminal activity. So when people have this rhetorical debate on whether it impacts U.S. sites, you could say, well, yeah, it impacts them because they have to comply with the court order, but it isn't, the infringement wouldn't the, be. It's targeting the worst of the worst there's, forereign there's, sites. There's, there's, two, there's two separate issues there. One is who is it targeting, and the second is who, who does it impact, right? So it targets foreign sites, absolutely, but the impact is very much on American sites because the remedies and the compliance and the potential liability is all entirely on American sites. Well, let's make clear, there's no liability at all in this bill. There's no money anywhere in this bill. All that the counterfeit uh, victims and, and piracy victims can get from this legislation after they've paid out of their own pocket for federal court litigation, all they can get, assuming they convince the court that they've met the high standards in the bill, is 
and instruction to U.S. companies, don't offer your services, don't provide your services to these rogue sites. So there's no liability, no one's, no one's making any money, no one's even getting compensated for the harm. I mean, but, but if, you, if you fail to block or if someone, uh, you know, somehow gets around these blocks, you certainly do run the risk of liability, right? I mean, no, no. The le again, the legislation is very clear. It's got to be so then what, a bad faith, if, willful non-compliance. So you get an order from a court, and there's a federal law telling you what to do, and you say, "No, I'm not going to do it. I know I should, but I'm not." That's a pretty different situation. <laughs> if if the so the but the actual compliance costs of being able to block these things or take some of these, you know, take the, the sites that are declared dedicated to infringement or whatever you want to call it, that is, that is a very real compliance cost. I mean, you used to say, oh, block them as if that's, you know, that's the easiest thing in the world. That's not necessarily true. I mean, the amount of effort, especially for a small startup, you know, for the, the Googles and Facebooks of the world, that may be easy, but for a startup that has to worry about, you know, how do we make sure that we don't run afoul of this law? That is that is a, a pretty serious cost to, to pay attention to you know what's coming in, making sure that you know, you're not providing ser to to services to to the sites on this list. Well, I, I did I did promise this woman. Uh, uh, she, okay. She's holding the microphone, with, uh, trying to get this. <laughs> Let's have a taut, laconic <coughs> Q and A. Uh, actually, it segues very nicely. I'm uh, my name is Tennille Christensen. I work with startups in Silicon Valley. And my question is. Um, you know, we already see some abuse of the existing notice and takedown regime where folks aren't particularly careful about how they structure their requests. And I'm wondering if there was any discussion about structuring SOPA or PIPA in a way that would have some sort of detriment to folks who went after something that it turns out wasn't actually a rogue site. Yeah, that's in there. I mean, you're, I think you're referring back to the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act notice and takedown procedure. Uh, and there are remedies in that law for uh, malicious notifications. Uh, the process we're talking about in the Stop Online Piracy Act and in the Protect IP Act are much stronger, uh, much more demanding on the complainant because they've got to go to federal court. DMCA, you just send a letter and boom, they, they take the site down. This is federal court process and both the legislation as well as existing federal rules of procedure provide for remedies for uh, you know, sort of willful misuse but, of that But that, process. I mean, to, to be fair, you know, especially with the DMCA, which we already have and we've already seen, you know, actually getting that, those provisions to, to, to have any weight whatsoever is, is almost impossible. The fact that it has to be willful and malicious as opposed to, you know, people just taking down sites willy-nilly, which, you know, or content willy-nilly under the DMCA, which does happen all the time. And we already have examples, certainly, you know, under, under the last change to copyright law, which was the Pro-IP Act, you know, now we're seeing abuses of that law with takedowns of sites that, you know, later were found to, to not be infringing or not, uh, you know, not have violated the law, you know, so I think that there's real fear there, and I think that the point is, is a good one that's been raised before, is why isn't there, you know, more punishment for those who make mistakes? And I know that, you know, it was one of the amendments raised in the, in the, the House markup was this idea that if you do, you know, um, uh, target a site that later turns out to, to not, um, you know, to, to not have been infringing or not fall afoul of this law, that there should be some punishment involved there, or at least attorney's costs. And that got rejected. So I think that there's a real concern, especially among the startup community in Silicon Valley, that you know they're going to have to deal with this. And we've seen these laws abused time and time and time again. And you know there is some sort of nod to like, okay, yes, you know, if you're willful and malicious, but that's a really, really high bar. Well, I agree that we should be absolutely careful here. Uh, we want to get it right. And I think that's part of why the part of the Stop Online Piracy Act that emulated the DMCA notice and takedown was removed in the, the markup by the sponsor of the bill. And so the only way to go is through federal court. So that's a much bigger check than in the DMCA. And uh, should we be careful? Absolutely, of course. So um, uh, since I've squeezed every last second out of this panel um, as possible, we're going to start our, our breakouts just after the question from the gentleman in the first row. Our next break, breakouts are at 11, um, uh, uh, oh, we have a coffee break. 
Oh, so okay, we have one more time for one question, but our breakouts are pretty much all, almost all Supreme Court related. We have geolocation Jones and a reasonable expectation of privacy in Columbia B. We have Reno versus ACLU. Did everybody realize it's the 15th anniversary this year, Reno versus ACLU? Um, that's, that's in Columbia A. And collecting online sales taxes, it's back, and that's in capital, the capital room. But um, let's we'll have one more question from... Hi there, I'm Andrew McLaughlin. Um, so in the spirit of like finding common ground to move forward now that we're laying aside the sort of war on the internet provisions from these bills, um, let me ask about something which strikes me as missing from the debate but uh, could be potentially uh, a useful avenue to pursue. Um, and that is plain old fashioned law enforcement. So one of the things that's very <coughs> striking about uh, uh, a law enforcement on the internet is that we've learned how to do it pretty well. So if you take, for example, child pornography, about 10 or 12 years ago, there was considerably more of it, more available in more ways, especially commercial child porn, than is true today. How we've clamped down on it is not by tinkering with the architecture of the internet uh, or using uh, legislation to kind of rejigger market dynamics. Rather, we've pursued aggressive, coordinated, global law enforcement, including targeting people in countries that won't cooperate with us. And we've done it by choking off finances, uh, using advanced intelligence techniques to identify malefactors, stick spyware on their computers, read their email, track them down, and then prosecute them. We've done the same thing somewhat more controversial with, uh, versely with online gamblers. And I think by any objective measure, uh, it's the case that there are probably no more than a couple of dozen uh, networks of individuals running the kind of rogue sites that do counterfeiting or um, uh, uh, copyright infringement of you know, first-run movies and TV shows. What if we put our brains around uh, taking the same approach that we took to child porn to those bad actors and try to take them down that way? I wish. I wish we could do that. I wish we could be as successful at it. Um, the reality is that particularly for sites located outside the United States, and, and there are quite a few more than just a couple of dozen, I'm afraid. I wish, again, it was only that little. But the reality is that there are a lot of criminals who are making a lot of money around the world. And you know from your government days uh, that the U.S. Trade Representative's office spends an immense amount of time trying to get countries to adopt and implement and enforce reasonable laws consistent with international standards that would take action. And I think if we could get there, that would be a tremendous help and might make a lot of this discussion less necessary. The fact is, though, we're light years from there, and there's no reason that people should be getting sick from counterfeit medicine or having their jobs uh, taken away because the companies that they work for can't reinvest in new products uh, because their profits are being, their, their, their ability to even recoup their investment is being siphoned away by foreign criminals. We, we shouldn't have to sit around and wait and endure that. I, I, I want to step in there. I appreciate uh, Andrew's uh, uh, remarks. He was focused on, he, he, he focused on the effectiveness of law enforcement for child pornography, which is particularly pernicious and, and uh, you know, sort of a more specialized. Your, your, your point is that uh, the broader uh, uh, piracy and infring, you know, copyright infringement and so forth is a much bigger problem just in terms of the numbers and it has big economic impact. Um, but there are two things, and, I think. And our ability to find partners. And, That's and, the biggest problem. And, and, and so I think, I think you, you, you made two points that I would not quickly want to agree with. One is that working with uh, in the international scene is going to take uh, forever, light years, uh, and, and that it's, you know, that, that casts it as a kind of failing or failed uh, proposition. I, I wouldn't be so quick to, to give up on that. And the other is that this particular mechanism and, uh, and, the, and the attempts at trying to use uh, D DS, DNS filtering, for example, are the most effective and uh, strongest thing that we can do, and therefore we should do it and, that, and, and, and focus all of our attention. And, I, and I'm not sure I agree with that either. I think we're a, a long way from having uh, real data and from having focused the attention that we need to have on this. If I can weigh in, I hear the, the child pornography um, sit, uh, um, case used quite a bit, whether it's in the context of the way uh, Mr. McLaughlin articulated it, or that we can do this for child pornography, therefore we should be able to do this for copyright infringement. I, I just <coughs> want to punctuate the fact that um, child pornography, Im uh, images of child abuse, are not content in any shape or form. They are not content. They are actual criminal evidence of a horrific felony. They're evidence, they're not content. No one in this, everybody in this audience probably has um, copyrighted material on their computers. 
Um, well, probably most of it's not infringing at all, um, or, or maybe subject to fair use. No one can have child pornography on their laptops in this place. It is criminally toxic, it's strict liability, there is no mi mitigating circumstances, no fair use to possess it. So, and, and it usually has a very specific signature um, that is well documented by law enforcement. So it's really a tricky thing to bring this, bring this situation up. The gentleman in the front row that asked the question two questions ago about ICANN um, was from Stop Badware, and along with the anti-spyware coalition that was founded by the Center for Pornography and Technology, that was a multi-stakeholder process where people kind of figured out this spyware ep epidemic and this adware epidemic and identified what qualifies as you know, those type of things, which are, which are the hard nuance. Uh, to figure out, and they, they virtually eradicated the problem of that magnitude within a short period of years. So I would kind of, I think that was an interesting, interesting set of questions. Um, there was one gentleman in the front row, I, I, let me ask, let me allow one more set of questions, the gentleman in the, in, well, um, in the third row, sir? You had, you had a question? There's a microphone right behind you. My question is this, uh, leaving aside the counterfeit goods, if you look at... Can you identify yourself? Oh, yes. I'm Andrew Bridges. Thanks. Uh, if we look at just copyright infringements, I know you all have done a lot of studies preparing for this legislation. It's been a lot of work up. Exactly how many sites are we talking about? And exactly how many of those have withstood your actual litigation efforts in the United States? Bearing in mind that there have been uh, cases against... Uh, Grokster got put out of business, Kazaa got put out of business, Mega Upload and Hot File are actually defending in the United States. Where is the frustration about efforts actually made? And then would you accept that since this appears to be offloading uh, your litigation risk to the government and creating vast dangers to defendants of shutting them down, without the normal bond protections you would have, if you have to put up for a preliminary injunction, would you be willing to fund a bond for government to act on your behalf to protect those wrongfully taken down? Okay, uh, I, would, I would suggest that um, while we do use litigation to go after some sites that we believe are involved in uh, trafficking stolen content, there is active law enforcement for pirate sites here, and we've had some very high-profile examples of that through the seizures that ICE has made over the past year or so. And uh, that's a very different thing than when we go to litigation with a, one of the uh, sites that we've targeted here in the United States. Um, there's probably different questions at issue with regard to those different types of sites. I know there are. And uh, the sites that were targeted and these bills are the foreign rogue sites that are equivalent to those that ICE has captured here, that seized here in the United States. So that is pure law enforcement. That is not the kind of uh, litigation that we would normally take on, even if we could, against those sites that are not housed here in the United States. And, and let's be clear that uh, in terms of what's going on now, laws the law will, you know, to the extent that, that uh, brand owners who are products are being counterfeited, copyright owners whose works are being pirated choose to uh, go to court and litigate that. They'll play it out under the fair judicial process, under existing law, and they'll win or they'll lose. In terms of the legislation that's under consideration, nothing changes substantive copyright law, nothing changes substantive trademark law. It's just a remedy to get at sites that are simply beyond the enforcement reach of our enforcement bodies now. And, you know, it's a higher standard to take action under these bills than it is under any existing uh, domestic copyright or, or counterfeiting provision. So we're going to pay for it ourselves. We're going to prove it at a higher standard than we've had to prove in any other case. And we're going to get no money, just, we hope, assuming the court agrees with us, the ability to disrupt these sites' business model of exploiting the American people. I think that's pretty reasonable. And, and there's universal agreement that these sites are a problem and that they deserve congressional attention. Well, um, 
I didn't intend to have, every, uh, have you have the last word, but you have the last word. So we have to go to our next set of panels at 11.30. Um, thank you to all the panelists. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, thank you.